Amen. It has been a wild weekend so far. We had a great weekend planned. We came down for the wedding Friday night, um, which, uh, full disclosure, my money was not on AJ being the first Helton married off. I'm just going to be straight up with you. My money wasn't on him, that's for sure, but uh, he got himself a good one. He was smart to snatch her up. But we came down Friday, and we were going to spend the weekend and stay and stay yesterday and then come in this morning. Um, but, you know, the, if you ever had a weekend that, uh, in the last, like, 36 hours right before the wedding, the, week, the whole weekend just changed. It just became a circus, right? Basketball tournament switched from Indianapolis to Kansas City. People got sick. Um, so my wife, Lindsay, is not here today. She sends her greetings, blessings. She's watching online. Honey, I love you. Um, we were getting ready to leave to come down here yesterday, and she had 102 temp. So she sends her blessings. And I love it when I go somewhere without her because I get what I'm starting to call the Lindsay greeting, okay? It's where somebody sees me and they're like, oh, hey, how you doing? It's good to see you guys here. Like, where's Lindsay? Well, she had to stay home today. But she, you know, she loves you. Okay, cool. See you later. And it's like, okay, I'll let her know you said hi. You know, and it was, but we love you, babe. Hope you're feeling good. And, um, and she'll probably notice she's watching now and she's like, what's he wearing? Because I was driving down last night from Kansas City straight down here, and about 8.45, I look in the back of the truck, and I'm like, my shirt's not there. <laughs> I've got an old basketball t-shirt on, and that's it. I forgot my shirt. Honey, my shirt is on the bed, all still on the hanger. So I left my shirt at home. So I texted Brad last night. He's like, dude, I'll have you a few ready you can pick out. And this is what he picks out. So anyway. I came to Mountain Movers, and all I got is this stinking shirt. That's it. <laughs> but it's been a heck of a week. Um, it's been a heck of a weekend. Um, but we are excited about the word today. I mean, anybody excited about the word? I've been asking God. I was praying, watching videos, kind of getting the feel of the house, what pa- uh, Pastors Brad and Missy have been speaking. And God really impressed upon me today, you know, Brad and Missy have been talking a lot about uh, revival and awakening and how we are kind of in the last days of Jesus. And, and, and Brad you know, was really stirred by the, the, the dream that he shared a few weeks back about the youth and that next generation. So I really wanted to kind of lend my voice to that today um, and talk about uh, that, that generational story. And I wanted to do it from 2 Samuel chapter 21. If you've got a device or a Bible, flip over to 2 Samuel 21. We're going to read verses 15 through 17. This is where King David was in his last earthly battle that he was fighting. And ironically enough, we find him still battling giants at this last battle that he was in the very beginning first battle that made him famous, that caused him to go viral um, uh, in his youth, the famous battle of David and Goliath, right? We remember that one. Well, this is his last earthly battle a few books later. And so I want to read through this and glean some, uh, some teachings. And I believe that God's going to bless us with this. Let's read together. First Samuel 21 verse 15. It said, once again, there was a battle between the Philistines and Israel. David went down with his men to fight against the Philistines and he became exhausted. Anybody ever just get tired? I've been fighting for long enough. I'm getting tired. Amen. Um, so David became exhausted. And Ishbi Binab, one of the descendants of Rapha, whose bronze spearhead weighed 300 shekels and who was armed with a new sword, somebody say new sword, said he would kill David. Verse 17, but Abishai, son of Zariah, came to David's rescue. And he struck the Philistine down and killed him. Remember, it's Abishai. He's going to become important later. Then David's men swore to him. They pulled him to the side, said, Pop, listen, never again will you go out with us to battle. Why? Not because he was washed up. Not because he was tired. Not because that old generation just needs to go by the wayside and let this new generation come. No, so that. The lamp of Israel will not be extinguished. So we're seeing a a, a story here where David is transitioning from being a giant slayer to a motivator. And we're seeing a beautiful picture of the generations coming together. The younger generation providing the energy and the passion 
and the stamina to the older generation who is still providing the light and the leadership. And this is a strong, beautiful picture of the current day church that we're going to talk about. So for the time that we have together, I want to talk uh, and bring the message today about building bridges from puberty (laughs) to patriarchs. And yes, we said puberty in church. So now that I got your attention, let's pray for the reading of the word. Father, I'm so grateful that you have dissected this word for us, God. I can do no thing with it beyond what your Holy Spirit can empower me to do. Do something with it between my mouth and their ears, God, that I cannot do. Dissect it hundreds of ways so that it is applicable to every single one of our lives, God, individually and purposefully. Take this word, have your way with it. In Jesus' name, the church said... Amen. I love this about King David, this transition that we see him going through. Because if you you could spend a lifetime studying King David, David is probably the most chronicled life in the Bible except for Jesus himself. And we're seeing David go through this transition that sometimes is tough for people. Amen? Where you go from being the guy on the front lines to having to play kind of the backline role a little bit. And it's tough. But I would love to have time to to read the rest of the story. It reads through how David's men um, slayed the rest of the giants. One of the giants had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. I'd love to tell you about that guy. Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. little side eye there. So the Bible's not boring, friend. I'm telling you. You're boring. You need to read the Bible. Okay? The Bible is not boring. You're boring. But this is a cool story where we see this next generation coming up and this older generation not just passing the baton, but building a bridge. You see, this isn't about just getting the one generation out of the way so that the next generation can come up. You're going to see this very distinctly. It's important that to the church that every generation stays involved and stay active and stay strong. Amen. We're not passing batons. We're building bridges. We're building bridges from, from those just starting into puberty and in the young and in high school still, all the way to the patriarchs and the matriarchs that are leading our churches with wisdom and guidance and experience. Amen. So we're not build, we're not, uh, driving wedges between the generations. That's what the devil wants to do. He wants to drive wedges between those generations. We're building bridges between the generations today, which Um, I love going back to verse 1, and we don't have to turn there, but I want to give you a little bit of the context of this story. In verse 1 of this chapter, it describes that Israel was in a, uh, it was, there was three successive years of famine in the land. And the reason that there had been three successive years of famine, because God brought a curse on Israel at this time because of what the previous generation had done. King Saul had broken a covenant that Joshua made with some people. We don't got time to go through that. But God brought this curse on the land. Okay? And so... It's, that launches us right into the importance of generations and how one generation can impact another generation. Now, I don't believe in generational curses anymore. After Jesus died on the cross, all curses were broken. Jesus died on the cross for my daddy's sins, for my daddy's daddy's sins, and for yours and my sins. Amen? But here's what I do believe in. I do believe in generational momentum. Generational momentum. Are you sitting them down or are you helping lift them up? And I'm not talking about just that generation that's coming behind you. I'm talking about are you giving momentum to the generation behind you and to the one that's ahead of you? Again, we're not passing batons today, church. We're building bridges today. We're strengthening the church amongst the generations. But what are you doing? And this is not a concept that you should get to the end of your life and look back and say, how did I do? Sunday by Sunday, we need to be evaluating this generation. Every year at church camps, we see the generations building and growing. This is something that you should evaluate all the time. What am I doing to propel the generations that are coming up behind me and to support the one that's ahead of me? Amen? And when each generation begins doing this, when each generation starts receiving the support and encouragement from the ones behind it and the one ahead of it, great gathering from the strengths that both both bring, 
then that's when the local church becomes efficient and bringing the gospel into a dark world. Dare I say, bring the light into a dark world. Amen. It's kind of like the cylinders of like a four cylinder engine. Back at my home church, Solid Rock, back in Jeff City, we talk about there's four generations, zero to 20 year old, 20 to 40 year old, 40 to 60 year old, which God, I'm in that one now. And then 60 and up. And to, uh, to me, it's kind of like the four cylinders of a motor. When you've got all four of those cylinders pulling when they're supposed to be pulling, pushing when they're supposed to be pushing, this motor is working in rhythm and in sync. And any mechanics know that timing is important to a motor. If this thing gets off a little bit, you're going to destroy the motor. And it's not going to be as powerful. It's not going to be able to push as much as it can. It's not going to be able to pull as much as it can. This is the local church, friend. When we've got all four generations working together, pulling when they're supposed to be pulling, pushing when they're supposed to be pushing, the local church is going to be a force to be reckoned with in a dark world. Amen? Amen. I love how um, Chris Hodges down at Church of the Highlands says, he says, the hope of the world is the local church mobilized. Not just the local church showing up on a Sunday and going through the motions. A local church that is intentional, that has purpose, where each generation is honing in on the strengths of the other and reaching out and building bridges and not wedges. That's when the local church is mobilized and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen? That's what happens. Don't take this lightly. You're not passing batons. You're building bridges. Look at somebody say, you're not passing a baton. You're building a bridge. Look at verse number 15. It says, once again, once again, Israel was in battle with the giants. The, the, the Bible tells us that King David had committed a sin in previous in his life, and God forgave him for that, but he said, look, dude, the sword is never going to leave your house. Your, your, your family's always going to be battling. So he was always fighting. But can I encourage someone today? Even if you win a battle... Today, the war is still going on tomorrow. The devil is not just going to walk away and go try to find somebody else. Amen. In fact, if you are a threat to him, if you're opening doors for somebody on a Sunday morning, if you're singing worship songs on a Sunday, if you're praying for your church on a Monday morning, the devil doesn't like you and he's going to be battling you every chance he gets. Even so, David was battling giants his whole life. The devil is never going to quit battling you. But I love what the Bible says. It says, David went down with his men. Even right up until the end, man, he was willing to jump in to the blood and the mud and the spit and get in there and rough it up. Until his boy said, Pop, hold it back, man. You, you know, what's that? Toby Keith, what is this? I was... I'm as good once as I ever was or something like that. That was King David, right? He said, give me one shot. I'll give him one good lick, and then I'm not so good after that. But anyway, um, but, but King David was willing to get in and accept that fight. This patriarch, aging as he was, was willing to get in there and mix it up with that younger generation. And to, I'll speak to that generation. You got, we got to be willing to accept the fight. Say it with me. To build a bridge... Accept the fight. We got to be willing to step in and fight this battle, no matter how many battles are in this war. Brad and Misty have been talking about it. The days of Jesus coming back is soon. I believe we are in the last days. It's not going to cruise into the ending. It's going to escalate into the ending, friend. We got to be ready to accept that fight. Amen. So verse number 16 talking about the battle itself said that David and his men that the giants were fighting again they were fighting against new swords in verse number 16 and one translation I love what it says it said they were fighting with state of the art technology that sound familiar they were armed with a new weapon the devil may be using new weapons today that we are not familiar with, that we have no context for. New technology today that everybody's trying to figure out what the long-term ramifications are. Or how do you daily work with this, let alone that? But these are new weapons that the devil is using, and we have to adjust to them. 
You know, my generation has to appreciate the new war that this current generation is fighting with the new weapons that the devil brings. But friends, can I tell you, the devil's weapons may change, but his tactics do not. His tactic is still to bring doubt, doubt the word of God, and frustration that God's not doing what he said he was going to do, or this whole thing is just a farce. But this current generation, it's doubt about the word of God. He's trying to get you to doubt who God is. He's not changed those tactics, but he's using different weapons. Amen? The devil's first temptation to Adam and Eve was to doubt the very word of God and to bring wonder. Is this really true? I mean, is it really true? The devil doesn't change his tactics. He uses different weapons. And we have to embrace the change, the different weaponry that the devil is using. He's not bashful about bringing different weapons. So to build a bridge with generations, we have to be willing to embrace the change of weaponry that the devil is bringing against us. Amen. Say it with me. To build a bridge, embrace the change. Verse number 17 says that the lamp must not extinguish. I love verse number 17 And we tried to emphasize it when we read it, but it wasn't that David was just passing that baton or stepping to the side. David still had a role to play, but see who looked, notice who said it. It wasn't David speaking to the younger generation and say, Hey, I'm still relevant. Hey, look at me over here. No, it was the younger generation saying, I see your value, David. I see your experience and we need it. We need to learn from it. We need your encouragement. We need your steadiness. We need your wisdom. But you got to take a step back. Amen? So it was the younger generation recognizing the value of the older generation, this guidance and the leadership and the vision that they can teach us and that this new generation can learn from. So, friends, we can learn from the generations that are behind us. We can learn from the generations that are ahead of us. And I love that it's Abishai looking at David saying, we value you, but you need to take on a different role now. And I love this because there is a really cool picture within a picture here. Because Abishai was the one that told David this. Abishai learned a very valuable lesson from King David just in the previous uh, book, 1 Samuel chapter 26. And we're not going to read the whole thing, but let me give you context. Before King David was actually king, King Saul was chasing David, trying to kill him, chasing him all over the country, trying to chase him down. Well, in this story, there's a time where Saul's army was asleep at night. King David, or David and Abishai went down into the camp, okay, snuck in, everybody's passed out, and the spear is next to him, and David has the opportunity to kill the guy that's trying to kill him, and he's got this young buck right next to him, and is right next to that came with him. So let's read it. David asked uh, uh, Ahimelech the Hittite and Abishai, son of Zariah, I love Old Testament names, Joaz's brother, he says, who will go down into the camp with me to Saul? I'll go with you, says who? Abishai. Abishai said, I'll go with you. Older generation said, who's willing to go down there with me? Younger generation steps up and says, I'll go. Verse number seven. So David and Abishai went to the army by night. There was Saul lying asleep inside the camp with his spear stuck in the ground near near his head. Abner and the soldiers were lying around him. Everybody passed out, okay? Okay. So here's David and Abishai, the older generation, the younger generation. Abishai pipes up and he says, David, I'll grab the spear. I will stick it right through his heart, dude. It won't take two. I'll get it done with the first one. Look at this. The God has provided the guy that's trying to kill you. He has given you into his hands. And the younger generation's like, let's go. And they're all excited. And there's a flashy thing. And let's go kill it. And fishermen know When a fish jumps at a flashy thing too quickly, what happens? (laughs) Bad things happen when you jump at flashy things too quickly. David says, no, Abishai. And David starts teaching him this really valuable lesson that comes into play later. David says, Abishai, it's not our job to take out who God is going to take out eventually. That's not our job. That's on God. So David said, Abishai, we're not going to kill him. Abishai's like, are you? 
freaking kidding me? He's right here, man. All it takes is one, dude, and it's done. It's over. David said, nope, we got to do this God's way. They go back. Fast forward now. Now, I, I can't imagine all of the lessons that Abishai has learned from King David over these years between these two stories. But the, the lesson that David taught Abishai and all of the mentoring that that older generation was willing to do with that younger generation comes and actually saves David's life that day on the battlefield. So friend, this is a beautiful picture. If the younger generation is willing to latch on to that older generation and there are valuable experiences and lessons to learn from them, but that older generation has to be willing to mentor and bring that younger generation, not get frustrated with them, but feed into them and mentor them to build that bridge. That's when the church becomes mobilized and the church becomes what Jesus needs it to be. Turn your neighbor and say, to build a church. Bring someone along to, oh, sorry, to build a church. Yeah, you can build a church too with it, but to build a bridge, bring someone along. You've got to be willing to bring someone along. This is a powerful moment where the zeal of youth clashes and initially with the wisdom, but then they both come together to learn this valuable lesson. Amen. I heard a quote, and you've probably heard it too, that youth is wasted on the young. <laughs> Youth is wasted on the young. I wish I had the energy that I had 20 years ago today, but I don't. But here I want to rephrase that quote. Youth is wasted if it's not guided. Let me say it. Youth is not wasted if it's guided. It can actually be harnessed. The question is who will guide it? Let each generation not cower from the battles of its day. Each of the generations, those, all those generations I talked about or generate the Gen Z or millennials or Gen X or baby boomers, we all have battles that we're struggling with. We all have ways, things that we're struggling with. We all have benefits and contributions that we can make. So for the last few moments that we have together, I want to speak to a couple that I specifically have influence into. Um, with these generational things, because one of the greatest battles that my generation has is that we're having to raise this generation Z. And we have no context for it. Generation Z, young folks, when you think your parents are dumb and they don't know anything, well, partially you're right. We didn't have no Facebook when we were your age, all right? This is new stuff. There was no social media, okay? There was no potential of ruining your life just by saying the wrong thing in an instant if I said the wrong thing my buddy knew it and maybe the person standing behind me knew it and that was it nowadays my life can change because of something I say on that's new but and that's a battle that my generation has to face I'm raising this generation z and the grandparents look at gen z and they just get frustrated parents look at gen z and they get frightened because we got skin in this game. We got to raise them to be productive citizens and parents and, and church members. And I've got more skin in that game. And the challenge that we have as parents is we start attaching the, either the success or the failure of our parenting to their outcome or how they're acting any given day. And friends, when you attach your happiness or the, your, your uh, judgment of your parenting on anybody else, that's dangerous, let alone a prepubescent teenager or a young adult who, who knows which way the wind's blowing that day or what side of the bed they got up on. You remember you were 15 once, right? Just depended on how your day got started. That's how the rest of the thing went. So I want to take a minute. And, and teach you something I wish somebody would have taught me early on. Because I got this way wrong initially. But I'm trying to get it better now. Are the four stages of parenting that is so critical on building the bridges between the generations. The first stage is from zero to six years old. And we are, at that stage, it's a, you're a micromanager. Okay? As a parent, you're saying it's about discipline. It's what we do and how do we act. It's that glorious time in a parent's life where you can still physically pick them up and put them where you want them to be. It's glorious. <laughs> but we're micromanaging. It's about, no, we don't run in church. We don't shout at this time. We don't say that. 
And it's not about, oh, little Billy just got a peanut allergy. That's why he hits people in the face. No, little Billy needs his butt whooped a couple times, okay? And then little Billy's going to know. No, we don't do that. And then if Billy lives through that stage, he's going to get to the next stage, which is ages 6 to 12 years old, where you move to being a manager now. And here it's about training. It's about why do we do what we do? Yeah, we don't punch people in the face because it hurts people and it damages relationships. Blah, blah, blah. This is why we do what This is why the whys come in. Well, why can't I do that? Why can't I put worms in my cereal in the morning? Why can't I do this? And we all know it, right? But this is that next stage. Here's why we don't do or do the things that we do. Now, the next stage is ages 12 to 18 years old. I got one here. I got two in the next one. This is where you become a supervisor. And it's more about coaching. This is one of the tougher transitional spots. Because this is where young people are starting to develop their worldviews. In a church context... You can't just tell them, this is what we believe because we believe it. They're going to look back at you and say, but why do we believe that? What's the Bible say? Why does the Bible say that? How does that apply to my life today in 2023? It was written in, I don't know, 65 AD or something like that. They're going to start developing their worldview. And you've got to supervise this. At this point, you can no longer just tell them what the answer is. You have to coach them in the process to get to the answer. You have to help them with the process of developing that worldview and answering. You have to collaborate with them on good decisions. Don't just tell them, this is what you should do. This is what you shouldn't do. You start giving them advice. You supervise the process, but you have to let them start growing in it. And then the last one is when you become a consultant. This is 18 to 24 years old. I got a couple in this one right now. My daughter is 20. She's coming down this fall to God's country in Oklahoma to go to Oklahoma State University this fall. Amen. So hopefully you'll see her a little more from time to time coming this way. But as a consultant from ages 18 to 24, and I would argue this really doesn't ever stop, but it's about friendship. It's about the relationship. It's enjoying this new level of interaction. Things are just different. This is where... It's like having coffee with a friend. You've got to give them advice and you've got to let them skin their knees and you've got to let them make mistakes. And at that point, you've got to let them go. But the battle that my generation wages and the trouble we get into is we invert this. In their toddler phases, we just let them run all over the place. We give them everything they can go play with, give them all the experiences, let them grow, let them flourish. And then when they become teenagers, we start trying to clamp down and clamp down because the stakes get higher, right? And when he's driving his little car in the living room, he may bump his head on the coffee table. When he's driving his car at 16, he can kill himself or somebody else or worse. Well, it's not worse than killing people, I guess, is there? But we invert it. And, and the more they get into those older times, we try to clamp down and hold more control. It's when then we put three GPS trackers and eight things on their car. And we got to call me when you're at that stoplight. And let me know when you get there. And I get it. Trust me. I know the, I know the intentionality there. But it's unhealthy. We are clamping down at just the time that we need to start letting them grow. And I didn't get this right at first. But I'm trying to now. I drove down here from Kansas City straight to Oklahoma, and my 16-year-old son drove from Kansas City to Jeff City. That'll make you fast and pray when you got your 16-year-old driving through Kansas City. And Anyway, but that's one of the biggest challenges that my generation has. Can I, I want to share with you one of the biggest contributions that we have also. My generation, this generation X, is it X? Yeah. We are in this unique spot where we lived through the transition to technology. I remember what life was prior to cell phones. I watched them come in. I watched the transition to them. So I have context as to what life was like prior. That helps me keep technology grounded in my life today. And, and that's one of the biggest things that we can bring to this next generation is because I had enough life prior to technology to keep it 
grounded in my life. I remember when Lindsay and I were dating, I bought her her first cell phone. It was one of those you flip the bottom down and you pull the, uh, the antenna out with your teeth. You can pull it out like that. And you do, 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 do. And it made that noise. That was the noise. Do, do, do. Right? And you dialed a phone. There was no internet. There was no nothing on it. Okay? And I remember the first ones when you were trying to type a text message, it was like, do, 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 do. and it took like 18 taps to spell it. You remember that? Because you had to go through all the letters on each number. It was crazy. But I remember that. So that gives me a unique context to give this next generation. I remember what it was like prior. And now I know. And I was young enough to embrace the technology to make it a part of our lives today. So I can help them understand that, yeah, you, the, this generation, I'm reading this book. Generation Z unfiltered. If you're raising Gen Zs or working with Gen Zs, anybody, I would just encourage you to read this book. In this book, it lists one of the greatest challenges of Generation Z is something it calls accessibility without accountability. This generation has access to anything, but they have developed very little accountability to that access. We can go onto YouTube and, and internet and we can experience anything that we want to early in life. I would argue earlier than we're probably ready for. They have access to this, but they don't have the level of accountability developed yet to coincide with it. The Bible was way ahead of us on this, actually. Paul in 1 Corinthians taught. He said, everything is possible but not everything is beneficial, right? Just because it's possible for me to go that and experience that or say that, it's not always beneficial. So in a world where I can go into a chat room or a comment line and I can put anything that I want, I have no immediate repercussions of that. I can bring context to this generation that says when you say the wrong things on the playground, little Billy punches you in the mouth and it will eventually come back to you. That's my contribution. That's one of the things I can contribute. You can learn anything from YouTube and the internet. You can experience anything. But have you developed a moral and value system to handle the weight of that experience yet? Let me say it this way, friends. Listen, trouble brews when our integrity does not mature or keep pace with our technology. It brings in something the book calls elastic morality. And I'll close by reading a little bit from this book. It says, the research reveals young adults today experience elastic morality. Because our culture cherishes qualities such as pluralism and tolerance, which are in and of themselves good, Many of our youth have lost the ability to think critically or to make moral judgments, which is unhealthy. As we create space for diversity, which is positive, one unintended consequence is that we often fail to prepare them to discern actual right from wrong. As the old saying goes, my grandpa used to say this, we have become so open-minded that our brains have fallen out. <laughs> Consequently, what is right or wrong can expand or bend. Listen, that the right choice is all relative to your personal experience, your personal conviction, and your personal opinion. That there is no steady, consistent morality. Oh, my friend, my generation is here to tell you that there is a true north today, that there is a source of ultimate reality, and it is this word of God that a generation can base their decisions and their actions on. And if we will bring this word of God with love and with compassion, not with an iron fist, but with love and compassion from one generation to the other, that's when the church will become mobilized and stronger than ever because there is a moral compass for this generation to base their decisions on and it is the word of God it was for my generation it was for the previous generations it's for their generation say it with me to build a bridge 
Give them a compass. Give them a compass. The last thing I want to share with you is I want to read a poem that this book ends with. And it pretty much encapsulates the entire thought for today. Listen, church, this is for you. It's called The Bridge Builder. An old man going a lone highway came at the evening, cold and gray, to a chasm vast and deep and wide through which was flowing a sullen tide. The old man crossed in the twilight dim, the sullen stream, no fear for him. But he turned when safe on the other side and he built a bridge to span the tide. Old man, said a fellow pilgrim near, you're wasting your strength with building here. Your journey will end with the ending day. You never will again pass this way. You've crossed this chasm deep and wide. Why build this bridge at evening tide? Well, the builder lifted his old gray head. Good friend in the path I have come, he said. There followed after me today a youth whose feet must pass this way. Now this chasm has been nothing to me, but to that fair-haired youth might a pitfall be. He too must cross in the twilight dim. Good friend, I'm building this bridge for him. For him. (laughs) Friends, we're not driving wedges between generations. We're not passing batons saying who's taking this next. We're building bridges. And when we do, the church becomes what Jesus is looking to come back for. A pure spotless bride taking and staking her claim in this world and taking every saved person with it that she can. But it's up to you. It's up to us. Every generation bridging to the others. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? You might be in here today, friend, and you have been listening and you realize that you've not been building very many bridges, actually. You've been either driving wedges, God forbid, you might have been burning bridges. And you realize today that God's got a greater call for you. God's not wanting you just to get out of the way in the past of the time. God wants you to build a bridge to that generation before and behind you. And if that's you today, friend, I want to pray for you and encourage you that you're not done. You can't go back and change everything of your past today, but in an instant, you can change your direction and you can change the way you're headed. If that's you and you say, God, I want to start building bridges and not burning them. I want to start building bridges today. If that's you, just raise your hand real quick. Thank you. I see, my God, thank you so much. Lord, bless those hands. Now, friends, if you're in this room, before you ever build a single bridge, you have to accept the bridge that Jesus built for you. You see, there was a chasm between us and God caused by sin. And it caused this big space between us and God. But Jesus came to this earth. Jesus died on that cross and stuck his arms out so he could bridge that chasm for you and for me. And the Bible says that he is in heaven right now making intercession for you, for you. So before you try building any bridges, you have to accept the bridge that Jesus built for you by his death on that cross. If you've never done it before, all you have to do is pray a prayer with us. If you know today's your day and you wanna give your heart to Jesus, Or maybe you need to recommit your heart to Jesus today. Just can you put your hand up, please? Thank you, Father. Thank my goodness. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. Thank you, ma'am. In the back. Thank you. Thank you, young lady. I see you. Thank you, Lord. Now, church, for the benefit of those who are recommitting or asking Jesus into their heart for the very first time, can we just pray together corporately and out loud and for their encouragement? Everybody say, Jesus, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I've done wrong things. I've burned some bridges. But now I know that your death on the cross 
and built a bridge for me. You gave your life. Now I give you mine. In Jesus' name, the church said, come on, can we give him a hand clap today? Yes.